Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Robin, Robin Smith, and I'm joining you from New Orleans, Louisiana, for this March um, Buddhist Recovery Network Academy. Um, and today we are going to be uh, hearing from Rachel Lewis, um, offering a teaching entitled Showing Up for Life as It Is. Um, so it's really wonderful to see you here. And um, really great to see that we have an international community today. Um, just because some of us um, can't stay for the, for the entire program, I just wanted to um, introduce the idea of Donna and to, you know, we have this um, monthly academy and we're now offering uh, weekly meetings, uh, one day a week. And we are, you know, the, the Buddhist Recovery Network is run completely by volunteer effort. And so if you would care to support the Buddhist Recovery Network and like to um, see us grow our programs, which I think we, we've had a lot of growth in the past, um, in the past year, I am going to place a link into the chat field. It's BuddhistRecovery.org, donate, and uh, we welcome your Donna at any time. So um, if I might tell you um, about our guest teacher, Rachel Lewis began meditating uh, while completing her physics PhD at Yale. She spent over 500 nights on silent retreats since 2003, including two three-month retreats. Her meditation training includes Spirit Rock's Dedicated Practitioners Program and Community Dharma Leaders Program. And she's currently a trainee in the IMS Retreat Teacher, Retreat Teacher Training Program. Um, and this involves um, apprenticing with Joseph Goldstein and other IMS teachers to teach retreats. She's also currently training as a practitioner of indigenous-focused oriented therapy a trauma therapy modality informed by an understanding of collective as well as individual suffering. Since 2010, she's taught classes and retreats in BC, including at a prison and in Vancouver's downtown East Side. She's also developed a songbook of Buddhist music, including her own choral arrangements of traditional chants. Her specialty is making profound teachings accessible through humor and storytelling. Very excited to have you here, Rachel. And um, I am going to turn the program over to you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with, with this wonderful group. It's exciting to see folks from so many different places. Um, I'm, um, <clears throat> I'm talking to you from the unceded land of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil peoples. Um, I know, notice a couple of you included um, the, the original inhabitants of your land uh, in your check-in as well. I just pasted into chat a link that where, especially if you live in North America, you can find the, folk, the, the groups um, whose land you're on. And uh, for those of us who are settlers uh, to uh, re relatively recent arrivals to um, to the land we're on. It can be a really poignant exploration to um, to learn more about the the people um, who, in many cases, are are still very present on the lands that we're living on. It it really challenges some of our preconceptions about um, yeah the story the stories we tell ourselves. And I've, in that sense, I feel like um, this is an exploration that's very much tied into um, Buddhist practice, to meditation, to mindfulness, because the, mo the more you practice, the more in touch with the difference between the stories you tell yourself and the, what's actually happening, um, the more you, you see that difference, the more that difference becomes apparent. So um, I think just, just before we, we um, start our meditation, I just wanted to, to set it up a little bit. So the, um, it, when, the, when the Buddha uh, can, looked across the world, he saw people looking for happiness in places where it was guaranteed to not be found. He saw people um, 
grasping after what was pleasant and pushing away what was what's unpleasant and um, identifying with everything, taking everything personally. And when he saw how much people longed for happiness and how confused they could be about how to find happiness, he would, his heart was moved with compassion and he decided to offer these teachings. And the, you know, it has, I, I feel like that, that insight he had that, you know, we're, we're pulled around by pleasant and unpleasant in a way that overrides our natural wisdom about how to re respond to life. Sometimes that even overrides our own sense of integrity. Um, the, this, this insight, you know, it's, it, it holds so true for, for, for all of us, whether we identify ourselves as having uh, addictions or not, so many behaviors that all of us engage in on a daily basis, seeking approval, um, overworking, uh, overeating, you know, the, these, these behaviors all stem from the same desire to be happy, to experience pleasure, not to suffer. And the Buddha saw that this desire is both the root of all of our suffering and also the root of all of our potential for happiness, for freedom. This sense that maybe it can be possible to, maybe there's another way to not suffer, uh, can be what leads us forward on this, this path of practice. So this, and as part of this, we, um, we start to look at how to develop our inner resources of contentment and tranquility and stability to help keep us grounded and oriented to, to the truth, to the present moment, even when what's happening right now isn't what we would choose. Um, and so I think for that might be enough for right now. Why don't we we tr try putting this into practice before we talk more about the the framework within which to understand it all? So check in with your body. See um, how how's your body doing? Are you aware of the space that you're in? You might want to just look around, look to your right, notice the shapes and colors you see there, and look to your left. Notice the shapes and colors. Maybe even turn around, orient to the space, look, looking above you, and getting a sense of the space that you're occupying right now. And noticing also how sitting in front of a screen can tend to pull all of your attention forward into, into this space that we're sharing together. So just trusting your ability to come back to this space that you're physically occupying. And in this, in this physical space that you're in, check in with the body. Notice what, how's the energy? Depending on what time it is where you are, you might feel really perky or kind of sluggish. If the energy is very sluggish, it can sometimes be helpful to stand up. If the energy is uh, really agitated, med meditating lying down can be helpful. So, and if the energy is kind of in between, finding a sitting posture can work. So if, you're, if you are gonna sit, notice the base of the body, the seat on the, on the chair or the cushion the feet on the floor. And let, let yourself settle into that base, into that support. It can feel like your body getting wider, taking up space. Or it could feel like the center of gravity going from your your thoughts, through your heart, to the, the base of your body. And 
letting the heaviness of the body connect you with the earth. Somebody said the other day, gravity is the earth's way of letting you know it loves you. So resting back into that support. The earth is here for you. This chair is here for you. And then from that support, the spine can grow tall, not held or rigid, just a natural vitality. The head growing up towards the ceiling. And the rest of the body can relax around the support that the spine offers. There's an expression possibly from a Zen tradition, strong back, soft belly, open heart. And this body that has this balance of uprightness, vigor, alertness on the one hand, and softness, ease, resting on the other hand. This body provides a good home base for our attention. taking in whatever sensations are present in the body with a wide angle lens, not needing to focus anywhere right now. Letting the attention be at home in the body. Letting the attention land with this body as it sits, feeling the sensations of sitting. Noticing how it is you can tell that the arms or legs are bent, that the seat is in contact with the chair or the cushion. What are the sensations that let you know that those things are true? within this broad field of awareness, sometimes it can be helpful to start a period of practice by deliberately bringing in a bit more focus. And this isn't, when I say focus, I don't mean shutting anything out or getting rid of anything. I mean, shining the spotlight of your awareness on one thing in particular and letting other things still be there, but in the background. 
So you might choose the sensations of breathing, or you might choose just the body as a whole. You could even choose sound. If you do choose breathing, noticing when you're breathing in and noticing when you're breathing out. Just that simple. Nothing fancy to do, nothing to make happen. Just knowing I'm right here, sitting and breathing. This is an in-breath. This is an out-breath. And you might notice that sometimes the mind goes to something other than whatever you've picked as the object of your meditation. And that's fine. It's just what minds do. And when that happens, it's really important to keep things simple. Just relax and come back. Let the attention land here with the breath and the body again.
And now you might try an experiment. Check in with your body and see if there are any sensations that you might label pleasant. It could be something just subtly pleasant, like a pleasantly warm or pleasantly cool area. There might be a part of your body where the breath feels, the motion due to the breath feels very relaxed and pleasant. You might just sweep your attention from your head to your feet, checking in if there's anything that you might label as pleasant. No further action needed once you've identified something as pleasant. Just know how pleasant. And now check in and see if there's any sensation in your body that you might label as unpleasant. Feelings of tightness or unpleasant temperature, constriction. And maybe there's nothing really unpleasant. Maybe there's just something slightly unpleasant. And again, there's nothing, nothing you need to do once you've identified something as unpleasant. We can just know, oh, that's unpleasant. So you might try sweeping your attention again from the head to the feet, checking for the presence of unpleasant feeling. Not with a project or fix it mindset, just with interest. Is this the way things are right now? And sometimes there are sensations in the body that are neither really pleasant nor really unpleasant just somewhere in the middle. We might call those neutral or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So there might be a distinct sensation that, you know, you can identify as contact or pressure, but it's not really pleasant or unpleasant. Or if it is, it's very, very slightly to one side or the other. So you might just scan your body and see if there's any sensations that fall in this area. And another thing you might have already noticed as you're scanning your body in this way is that the category that a particular sensation falls into can change moment to moment. Something might feel really unpleasant in one moment. And then the intensity might diminish to the point where it's really almost neutral. So 
Something that's neutral might become pleasant as you stay with it. You just don't know how things are going to change one moment to the next. And keeping on watching, keeping on staying present with sensations in the body as they are. Instead of getting lost in our thoughts about them or our reactivity to them, our assumptions about them, it can help the mind to stay fresh and available. So just resting the attention back in the body, knowing this is how things are for me right now. This body, this breath, this play of sensations. This attention that can take it all in. It can know what's happening one moment to the next. And noticing also what's pleasant about letting the mind relax all its preoccupations and just land right here. This simplicity can be really pleasant. Letting go of anything that takes us out of this present moment over and over again. Just relaxing into this moment the way it is.
And as you hear the sound of the bell that brings this period of formal practice to a close, seeing if it's possible to keep some of the same sense of steady, open awareness present with you. So we'll open it up for questions in just a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to say uh, uh, one little piece, I think. Um, so we were just looking at the body in terms of not just the sensations, but whether the sensations register as pleasant or unpleasant or in between. And it's this, this quality that in Buddhist circles is called Vedana, or affective tone, if you if you want a longer English equivalent, um, that stirs up so much reactivity in the mind. You might, uh, you know, the, it's it's the moment of pleasure of um, tasty food, say, or whatever your favorite sense pleasure is, that keeps us scheming about how to get more of that thing. It's the, the painfulness of um, feelings like rejection or sadness or fear that uh, keeps us fleeing from, from turning toward this moment of experience the way it is. The, the Buddha saw that when, when people um, experience painful feeling, they tend to uh, either try to cover it up with pleasant feeling. Has anybody ever uh, eaten ice cream because they were sad? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very human thing to do to try to displace an unpleasant thing, whether physical or mental or emotional, with something pleasant. Um, and if, if it's impossible to do that, people tend to get you know, really caught in despair or sadness about the unpleasantness that there that is present for them. And the also the alternative that the Buddha presented is to turn directly toward your experience as it is. And that was what we were doing in this practice in a small way, just noticing, oh, this body sensation is pleasant and staying with it as it changes. Oh, this, this sensation is unpleasant. And noticing that it's possible to stay with unpleasant as it changes and maybe gets more intense or maybe gets less intense, but really trusting our own capacity to, to hold this moment in our kind awareness without getting lost in reactivity. And uh, uh, an approach to intensity that um, I've found really helpful. So there's there's two versions. One was developed many years ago by Michelle McDonald called Rain. And a new a version that I encountered only a year or two ago, uh, a variation by a British teacher named Chris Chris Cullen. Uh, he calls it Grain, the uh, vegan version of Rain, I guess. I don't know. Um, and so the steps of grain are first to ground. So well, that's what we were doing at the beginning of our practice period. Know where you are. Feel your seat on the cushion. Feel your feet on the ground. Have a sense of um, supportedness, of not being in this alone in some sense. So find, find a sense of inner stability somehow. And then the next step is recognition, turning toward Let's, let's assume it's a physical pain that we're being with, turning toward this, this um, perhaps quite intense or chronic physical pain. Recognize, oh, right, this is pain. Then the A stands for attitude or acceptance, checking and seeing, is it possible to bring an attitude of kind interest to this? And if not, it might be time to go back to the grounding. And part of that can be finding a part of the body that isn't in pain, that feels okay, maybe even pleasant. And then once the, the heart and the mind and the body feel a bit more resourced or steady, turning back towards what's difficult 
and to the extent that it's possible to do so with uh, a, a heart that's open and, and allowing. Then the I is um, intimacy or interest or investigation. It's this, this willingness to get close to the difficulty, to stay with it. Um, there was a, a, a time on a, a, I was on a retreat team sitting on, on a, a cushion on the front of, uh, front of the hall with a lot of people sitting in the hall. And so I was feeling a little bit of pressure to look like a good meditator, you know, have a nice posture and everything. And I hadn't set up quite right. And my right leg fell sound asleep. It was pins and needles and very uncomfortable. And when I was sort of just sort of looking at it out of the corner of my eye, it felt unbearable. It was just so intense. I, I, I couldn't stand it. And the desire to move, to shift the posture got really strong. But I noticed that when I turned my full attention to it, the intensity actually was quite variable. And, and the, the act of bringing interest to that um, intense but ultimately not harmful physical sensation brought some spaciousness into the heart and mind. And I, I could be with it as intensity instead of getting caught up in the reaction of hating it and wanting to get away from it. I was still really relieved when the bell rang for the end of the sit, though. Um, so, so yeah, so that's intimacy or investigation. And then the N of grain stands for uh, nature or not me. Just the understanding that things arise out of causes and conditions that you don't need to take this personally. Even if it's uh, an emotion or a story uh, thought that you're having, this, that too is just something that arises when conditions are right and changes when conditions change. So to not, yeah, thanks for that summary. Um, so to not, um, to not make things harder than they need to be. There's a, a, another teaching in Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths, that I'm, I'm sure you've heard many versions of, and, and one version uh, that I quite like, the first, the first and second truths are, stuff happens as number one. And number two is, often we make it harder than, we need, than it needs to be. And just to really get interested in how much of this is extra, how much, how might I be making this harder than it needs to be by the stories that I'm telling myself about it? So, um, yeah, so I feel like I could blab on for, for a long time, but I um, just want to check if there's any questions or responses or clarifications. You can either use the raise hand button that might be in the, uh, in the participants menu or possibly in the, um, reactions menu, um, or we could go to gallery view and uh, you could wave, wave your um, physical hand. Well, while that's, um, folks are thinking about that, I was wondering if you could um, maybe talk about a little bit about the neutral response and how that's still a response. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, um, this, so this thing I'm calling Vedana is an it's an intrinsic um, property of each moment of experience. Um, it's not something that we make happen. It does depend on. Um, uh, context and you know whatever else is going on for us and our own personal conditioning so um, something that <laughs> so I uh, um, something that's pleasant to one person can be very unpleasant to another person um, I really like ginger as a flavor and uh, chocolate I, once one time for some my friend's birthday I bought her a box of chocolate covered candied ginger and she thought it was like a caramel or something so she popped one in her mouth and started eating and then she started crying because she wasn't expecting the ginger flavor and it was it was intense and for her very unpleasant um, so 
so yeah, so you don't necessarily know where a particular sensation is going to land on that spectrum for any given individual. The neutral Vedana is, is really interesting because evolutionarily speaking, you know, we're so used to attuning to either the pleasant or the unpleasant, you know, an opportunity to eat face, tasty food, yeah, it's, to eat cilantro if that's tasty for you or to avoid cilantro if it's not tasty for you. Um, and we're, we're attuned to uh, unpleasant Vedana because it could indicate a threat, something we need to try to avoid. And with neutral Vedana, we've sort of evolved to register it as something that doesn't need attention. So I can free up bandwidth to, to tune into something else that's more threatening or more enticing. And what we're doing in meditation is learning to stay present even when stuff's pretty neutral. Gil Fronstahl has the, has the expression, if it's not boring, it's not Buddhism. Um, you know, and if you think about breath meditation, for example, which is the main practice for a lot of people, you know, there's nothing inherently alluring about the breath. Um, and so really it's the, the, what keeps us engaging with it is um, the, the, the pleasantness of the mind that's really simple and the way in which this neutral Vedana can be um, restful, I guess. It's like there's nothing strong here, so, so it's, it's relaxing, right? You, you might think of boredom as being relaxation plus judgment. Like it's, if things are really calm, if you like it, it's, it's relaxing and soothing. And if you don't like it, it's boring. Um, so so we're, we're developing a taste for neutral Vedana in, um, in our meditation practice. We're learning to enjoy the, the, the subtlety of um, things that don't impinge strongly. And, you know, we're certainly not trying to make it so that everything only ever feels neutral. Not at all. Things are still going to feel pleasant and unpleasant. The, um, the, the Buddha is described as um, eating food, clearly knowing what's pleasant in the taste, experiencing the pleasantness of the taste, but without greed for it. So the Buddha, a fully awakened being still experiences pleasant and unpleasant and neutral as, as experiences, but without then going to the next step of, I want this, I don't want this, I'm going to ignore this. Just staying really available for, oh, right, this is strongly pleasant. This is intensely unpleasant. This is kind of meh. You know, to know that without reactivity is, um, is yeah, how, how the awakened heart and mind would be with experience. Yeah, and yeah, and it's really true that um, when one unpleasant thing happens to us, often we um, we then add extra, like we make it into like a layer cake of unpleasantness by saying, "Why is this happening to me? What did I do wrong? What? How can I avoid this? Oh, I'm such an idiot for having this happen." And um, and that's. That's the the kind of suffering that is making things harder than they than they need to be, you know. To to allow for the difficulty, I think somebody told me in the in the Marines there's an expression, "Embrace the suck," you know. Like if if you're having to do physically taxing things and it's two in the morning and it's raining and cold, um, it's hard. And if you resist the, the difficulty of it, you make it harder. And that's, that's what we're learning to, to not do or to not do, to, to let hard things be hard without adding on a layer of resistance and resentment and scheming to make it different than it is, um, or scheming to make things that are okay better than they are. You know, I, I was talking to my meditation teacher back in the day about somebody who I was really trying to become friends with, you know, she and I had a lot of common interests and I, I don't know, it, and, and, and yet nothing seemed to really be catching. And 
my teacher just said to me, how about you let things be the way they are? And I realized, yeah, I was really scheming to make, to try to make this other person feel the same interest that I did in, you know, being friends or collaborators or creating things together and to, to let things not happen if they're not happening. And so there's a, there's a question in chat about um, understanding neutral and then immediately recategorizing it as pleasant or unpleasant. Yeah, and I think that that can be really natural. Like if, you know, it's not three bins, it's a, it's a continuum. So there's things that are excruciatingly painful on one end and really delightful on the other end. And then in the middle, there's like, there's strictly neutral and then there's slightly pleasant and slightly unpleasant. And you might find that as you pay attention to something that initially registered as neutral, as you get to see it in more detail, it might start to feel unpleasant or, um, or, or pleasant. Or you might notice that, oh, this, this neutral thing is actually kind of pleasant to spend time with. It's, it's restful to be here with it. And so the, the actual experience of the thing can legitimately change moment to moment. Um, and so to not, to not worry about getting the right label and to certainly not worry about getting the right label on the first try. It's this, this way of looking at our experience is um, more a way of um, trying to bring, bring into our awareness the uh, opportunities for letting go, for not grasping, for not clinging on to things. Because it's when we're not paying attention, it's so immediate, you know, the, the sense contact and, the, and the, the quality of pleasantness and unpleasantness do genuinely come together. So, so you're always gonna have both. But then after that um, pleasantness or unpleasantness or neutralness, there, it, when we're not paying attention, there's, there's um, such a close, such a quick progress from uh, pleasant to I like it to I want more and tuning into oh pleasant gives us the opportunity to opt out of that subsequent um, chain so to be able to say oh that's pleasant yeah pleasant without going to oh if I sell my car, I can buy more of it, right? You know, like to just let pleasant be pleasant without making a big thing about it. And to notice um, when pleasant becomes less pleasant. There was a study I read that said, um, they, they tried to quantify how much people enjoy dessert. <laughs> so they gave people pieces of cheesecake or something like, it might've been, I, I, I don't know what kind of dessert it was, but, um, and asked them to uh, take a bite and report on how good it tasted. And everybody was like, oh yeah, that's delicious. And the second bite, yeah, that's really good. And the third bite, oh, I like that. And by the seventh bite, it was like, yeah, it's okay, I guess. And after the seventh bite, it was like, you know, they might as well have been eating um, sawdust. You know, they, they, it just wasn't um, impinging in the same way that it did initially. And my, uh, my dear in-laws got me a, birthday cake a few months ago and uh, I I had I got really excited when I saw it because birthday cake like who doesn't like birthday cake and I start eating it and I, I realize oh this actually kind of just tastes like Crisco you know it's 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 you know that sort of like greasy grocery store icing um, and yet I kept eating past noticing that right because it was birthday cake Right. So when we when we bring mindfulness to um, our actual experience right now, we can disentangle our assumptions about how pleasant it should be from our observation about how pleasant it actually is. And then we can make better decisions about, OK, do I want to keep doing this? So how much effort do I want to put into do doing this? Thank you so much, Rachel, Rachel. And yeah, just it was a very thoughtful session, and I love the meditation and the way that you've unpacked Vedana. It um, makes it uh, 
uh, I'm more aware of that um, at the moment than I was before I began this practice today. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to um, put your website here in chat in case folks want to, to find out more about you and your teachings or kind of follow what's what's happening in um, your world of teaching. And um, just very grateful that folks showed up today and brought themselves to this practice. It was really good to have Sangha in this community. And um, I, if you'd like to support the Buddhist Recovery Network and support its teachers to support Rachel, um, I'm going to uh, add the link again on our website for donation. But I'm also going to, and I'm also going to add. Um, our Facebook group and um, the link to the podcast. Um, and if all goes well, this will be a podcast very soon. And you can come back to it um, and kind of re revisit this idea of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral in our responses. Um, so next month we have um, on our academy, we'll have Mary Stankovich, who I'm not sure what the topic of her teaching is yet, but. Um, She'll be with us, and that is April 4th. And I will leave the room open here for a few more minutes if there are items in the chat that you'd like to, to copy and hang on to. And um, yeah, just wishing you all well. I'm so grateful you were here with us today, Rachel. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Lovely to be here with you. <laughs>